Hello, I'm Dr. Matthew Stevens, and together with Dr. Richard Hall, Swansea University, we'll be delivering this course on America in a Nutshell, a history of Pennsylvania from William Penn to Donald Trump, 1631 to 2016. Now, we hope that you'll see in this module uh, how Pennsylvania manifests itself as exemplary of a whole series of developments of 18th, 19th, and 20th century history, uh, both in America and indeed uh, covering themes which are prominent in uh, the industrialized West as well. So really it should be a jumping off point to further American and modern history in general. Now it's normal at this point to offer students a range of further information about the assessment on the modules. Uh, I want to make clear that there are in fact two uh, parallel modules covered by these lectures. HH 2016, that's the uh, 20 credit standard version of this module, and HH 2016B, that is the 30 credit DACE version of the module. Now, both uh, 2016 and 2016B share a single Blackboard page, and the assessment information there is set out in two separate sections. There should be a, a clearly marked section there for 2016B. Please ensure that you are looking at the assessment information for your particular module. If you have any further questions, please contact myself or Dr. Hall by email, or you may see Dr. Hall in person in the Keir Hardy building on Singleton campus. Now, I'm going to wrap up this brief uh, introductory slide here by saying that the university now recommends that we offer uh, what are called trigger warnings to students on modules. Uh, this is just to give you a heads up that uh, the module will cover uh, a variety of aspects of human history which you might find troubling. Uh, uh, for those of you in the helicopter parent cotton wool snowflake generation, you need to know that over 200 years of history will inevitably, inevitably cover the entire panoply of human experience, including uh, war, plague, famine, uh, human misery, corruption, racism, sexism, and any number of other things you'll see in the evening news any given day. If you don't think that uh, you are emotionally equipped to deal with these topics, then you might uh, choose to change module. So to begin in earnest, uh, this is a lecture which just introduces you to the environment and ecology of Pennsylvania. And for those who might not be familiar with uh, the location of Pennsylvania, I think it's important that we start with this map here. Uh, I'd like you to take note of the fact that uh, Pennsylvania, despite having a climate which is much colder than Britain in the winter, is actually much further south. Pennsylvania is on a uh, last two similar to Madrid, for example. But whilst in the summer temperatures will regularly reach 30 degrees or more, in the winter uh, temperatures typically linger uh, below zero. In size, Pennsylvania is about the same as England, uh, 46,000 square miles to England's 50,000 square miles. And Pennsylvania is over six times larger than Wales, so that gives you a frame of reference. Uh, weather tends to come to Pennsylvania from the northwest, from uh, Canada, and I hope you can see here this cold weather uh, arrow I've put on the map. That's the prevailing course of the jet stream, so it's constantly bringing cold air down onto Pennsylvania, making winters very frigid. Uh, note in contrast, the warm currents of the ocean here, which uh, bring uh, warm equatorial waters all the way to Britain and Western Europe and keep England, uh, Wales, Scotland, Ireland relatively warm by comparison. So it's uh, quite a bit colder despite the fact it's further south. Now Pennsylvania separates New England from the rest of what is now the United States. For this reason it's called the Keystone State. Uh, the original 13 colonies on the east coast of America uh, in this arc here, uh, in the minds of early Americans, uh, 
form something equivalent to the arch over doorway, which is supported by a central stone on which the others lean. Uh, for that reason, Pennsylvania is called the Keystone State uh, from an early, po early point in colonial history. It's very much a kind of transitional area, as we'll see in a moment with respect to climate. It separates the culturally distinct New England colonies of early America, uh, which are very much about uh, individual uh, immigrant farmers and uh, small farms and industry, and the South of America, which is very much about plantation economies of large scale agricultural produce. Uh, the South being very much a slave economy where labor is provided by slaves in the North, of course, being an economy uh, driven by the kind of tenant farmer working his land and the small industrialist. So it's very much uh, separates social climates in America. It also separates uh, environment in a sense that places north of Pennsylvania tend to have very long, cold winters. Places south of Pennsylvania tend to have relatively mild, warm winters. I'll just to remind you here of the definitions of the terms environment and ecology. Uh, environment, of course, is the physical surroundings or conditions in which a person or other organisms uh, lives and develops. Uh, the external conditions in general affecting life, existence, or uh, properties of an organism or object. And really for us, it's about the, the, the physical and environmental uh, conditions. You know, what's the weather like? What's the soil like? What's the geography like? Uh, ecology, on the other hand, is a branch of biology that deals with the relationships between living organisms and their environment. And so, for example, uh, Native Americans who uh, some thousands of years before the arrival of uh, English settlers, uh, Native Americans that were living in Pennsylvania had to develop a, a series of ways of interacting with the environment so as to survive these long, cold winters. Uh, the uh, Dutch and eventually English settlers uh, and Welsh settlers, when they arrived from uh, Britain, uh, they, ha they develop their, their own systems of interacting with the local environment, and I hope we'll convey that over the course of the course. In terms of environment, uh, if we think about Pennsylvania without humans, 95% uh, of Pennsylvania uh, would be forested, and that's overwhelmingly deciduous forest. So those are trees, of course, which lose their leaves in the winter as opposed to uh, uh, pine forests. About 1.5% of Pennsylvania is comprised of wetlands, that's swamp, marsh, uh, bogs, and so forth. And about 0.5, uh, half of a percent, Pennsylvania is covered by water. And most of the uh, water which is on the surface of Pennsylvania is in uh, rivers and streams rather than in lakes. This is because Pennsylvania, of course, is divided between east and west by the Appalachian Mountains. Uh, and the Allegheny Plateau so is a, a relatively uh, difficult terrain of peaks which are not as high as you'd have in the Alps. That's to say, the mountains of Pennsylvania never get so high so as that they're bald rock as you'd have in the, the Rockies or the Alps. Uh, they well have trees right to the tops of the mountains in central Pennsylvania, but they are still too steep and too high for agriculture. And they're steep enough and high enough to impede uh, the transit of goods from east and west for a very long time until the coming of the railways, really. Uh, something we'll cover in a few weeks' time. Uh, Pennsylvania is also divided uh, by climate north and south. And this, uh, I want you to take note of the map in the bottom right here. This is the Philadelphia area where the pointer is now, the area first settled uh, in Pennsylvania. And it is in a, a climate which uh, is relatively mild uh, by Pennsylvania standards. As I'll come back to in a moment, you get over 200 uh, growing days for your crops in your fields. Whereas northern Pennsylvania, 
is just on the other side of, of a natural climatic divide. Uh, northern Pennsylvania receives the brunt of cold winds down from Canada in the winter. Uh, northern Pennsylvania's later springs, earlier uh, autumns, and there's as little as maybe 120 growing days available to uh, farmers in the northern half of, of the Commonwealth. And I'll come back to this point of Pennsylvania as a state versus Pennsylvania as a Commonwealth in the future, but just to give you a heads up uh, looking to the rest of the course, Pennsylvania starts as a colony and becomes a Commonwealth. A uh, Commonwealth is a place where the uh, natural resources of a place are there for the benefit of all within it. And that's something a bit different from a state, uh, which is more of a, a political distinction. And Pennsylvania, even today, remains a commonwealth which acts as a state within the United States. Uh, we'll give you more details of that in due course, but I just wanted to clear that up in case you're wondering why I would refer to Pennsylvania as a commonwealth from time to time. Uh, really, best practice is always to call Pennsylvania a commonwealth, unless you're dealing specifically with uh, some aspect of the political history of the state. This is just another map to give you a indication of the different microclimates and regions within Pennsylvania. I've indicated uh, two points on the map here, which we'll come back to in a moment. Uh, the Poconos here and Elk County over here. Do try and keep those in mind. I'll come back to those uh, in just a couple of slides. What I want to point out here uh, is the way in which the geology of Pennsylvania creates a series of different, uh, a series of different geological environments. So here, for example, in the northwest is a small uh, coastal plain along the inland sea uh, that we call Lake Erie. And there was a, a Native American group called the Erie tribe of Indians that lived in that distinctive coastal plain. South of that, uh, this glacial region here, and again, there's a, a glacial uh, region in the northeast, uh, these are where, uh, in the last ice age, the glaciers stopped. And so, uh, whilst the northern half of Pennsylvania is colder and has a shorter growing season than the southern half, these areas here and here uh, have benefited from a lot of good soils which were deposited there by the last glaciers and they're quite suitable uh, for agriculture. Whereas the plateau, as you would expect from a place called a plateau, uh, is higher, uh, less suitable for agriculture. Uh, the deep valley section speaks for itself. And you can see in this general curvature here the line of the Appalachian Mountains. Uh, again, the southeast with Philadelphia, the uh, largest city in Pennsylvania throughout its history uh, until today is based. Uh, and over here in the southwest where Pittsburgh, the second largest city in Pennsylvania is based, uh, these are, again, very distinctive areas, each of which has a, a kind of catchment. Uh, Pittsburgh is in a, a low plateau, which is to say it's higher than the east Pennsylvania, but it's still high enough to make agriculture a bit more difficult. Uh, Pennsylvania is a much more uh, seasonally distinct uh, place than Britain, for example. That is to say, there are much more, much greater extremes of weather between summer and winter. Uh, in summer, Pennsylvania is uh, fertile. Uh, and if you clear the forest away, uh, there's good ground for agriculture in the northwest, the northeast, and most of the southern part of the state. The natural forest is uh, what they call it oak hickory forest or hardwood forest. Uh, this is a very slow growing, uh, slow growing type of forest compared to say a, a bamboo forest that you'd have in Southeast Asia. 
uh, an oak hickory forest takes some 100 years and more to reach uh, maturity, and a uh, uh, it's what we call a climax community in terms of uh, ecological development. So if you were to start with a naked field that then forms a layer of mosses and then grasses, grasses turn into shrubland, then, then the, uh, the mature oak hickory forest is the climax community uh, for that environment. In marshlands, there is a wide range of seasonal aquatic plant life. Uh, if you look at this photo in the bottom left here, you'll see some marshlands uh, in northwest Pennsylvania. Uh, you can see they, they look verdant and green, but of course in the winter, uh, if I use the pointer here, in the winter all of these areas here, which appear to be very green and verdant uh, in this summer photo, uh, that is all seasonal vegetation. It will die back just below the surface of the water and you'll have something that looks ostensibly much more like a lake. These type of marshlands contain lily pads, cattails, etc., and they're much more. Uh, there's much more biodiversity in Pennsylvania than you get in Britain. Again, I just give you a little map in the top corner up here to indicate the three most populous parts of Pennsylvania: uh, in the northwest, southwest, and southeast. These are the areas which are first cleared, uh, first cleared of their forest lands and converted to agriculture. Again, thinking about uh, summer activities here, the growing season, as I alluded to before, can be very different in different parts of Pennsylvania. Uh, the period between the last spring frost and the first autumn frost is typically about 120 to 180 days. 120 days. Uh, is more accurate if we're looking at the mountainous regions or the northern parts of the Commonwealth. Uh, but if you were in Philadelphia in the southeast, the part first uh, uh, settled by Europeans, that growing season could be as long as 220 to 240 days. Now, the uh, uh, Native Americans, of course, uh, focused on uh, growing uh, corn as we call it in America, meaning maize, as you'll note in Britain, uh, maize takes about 60 to 100 days to mature. i give you a photo here, some maize. Uh, this was suitable for all parts of Pennsylvania. The Erie Indians in the northwest, the Susquehannock Indians in the southeast, uh, and again, I use the word Indian to describe Native Americans here uh, in a re respectful way, because this is the way it, it, uh, that they're referred to in the historiography that you'll encounter. Uh, they could grow maize anywhere in what is now the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Now the cereals, the wheat, oats, barley, etc., which were brought, uh, brought to Pennsylvania and cultivated by European settlers, uh, those have a much longer a maturation period of about 120 days. And so, for example, if you were a uh, farmer of wheat and oats, you would find that in the northwest of Pennsylvania, uh, the northern parts of the Commonwealth, it's sometimes very difficult to see your crops through to maturity and successful harvest in that window between the spring frosts and the autumn frosts. Uh, legume crops, uh, especially soybeans, are grown in very large quantities uh, today in Pennsylvania. Some legume crops were also grown uh, by Native Americans. Uh, and these only take about 50 to 70 days to mature. And so you can hedge against early uh, autumn frosts, which will deprive you of the harvest. You can hedge against that by planting uh, more beans, which mature quickly, and you can be sure you're going to get them off the fields. Uh, grapes are grown in that uh, narrow uh, coastal plain in northwest Pennsylvania along the inland sea that we call Lake Erie. And uh, the growing of grapes for wine is a very important part of the economy there today. But that was that's something which would only develop really in the late 19th, particularly the 20th century. 
If we look at the animal life of Pennsylvania, uh, there are several large mammals in Pennsylvania. There are eastern elk, uh, or wapiti, as they're called uh, by the Native Americans. Uh, if you look at the photograph on the bottom right here, this is from a uh, 1960s uh, Pennsylvania Game Commission publication here. So here's the, the Game Commission officer and his son. Uh, it's a rather cute picture there. Uh, and you can see well in this picture the relative size of the oak, excuse me, the relative size of the elk on the left here compared to a human being. And that elk compar compared to a deer, a white-tailed deer, uh, that being the kind of deer indigenous to Pennsylvania. Uh, they're white-tailed deer are about the same size as uh, uh, the kind of uh, red deer that we get in Britain. Now, if we think about the, the uh, ecology here, the long-term interaction of humans with the environment, uh, there's an interesting story to be told because it's, it's not one of uh, humans entirely displacing animals, but rather one of humans and animals adapting to each other in Pennsylvania. Uh, if I start with the elk first, uh, they're in decline in southeast Pennsylvania by 715, excuse me, by 1750. Uh, on the Pennsylvania uh, plateau, that's to say in the northwest of Pennsylvania, there's pressure on the elk population by 1800. And if you recall, I pointed out Elk County in northwest Pennsylvania a couple of slides back. Uh, that's established in 1843 and named uh, so named because the last uh, herd of elk uh, in the wild exists there at that time. In 1867, Jim Jacobs, a, a Native American, uh, uh, hunts and kills, or is believed to have hunted and killed, uh, the last uh, wild elk in Pennsylvania. But the species is reintroduced in 1913 uh, from western parts of America, and there's now a stable and uh, carefully managed herd of around 600 uh, elk in Pennsylvania, largely in Elk County once more. Uh, they survived their longest because that's the part of, of Pennsylvania which is last settled and last cultivated uh, by Europeans. Now your typical uh, elk is about uh, 100 inches in length, 60 inches in height, and 700 pounds or 50 stone. Uh, we can compare that with the uh, the second largest uh, type of uh, type of deer in Pennsylvania, the white-tailed deer. Uh, the white-tailed is the official state animal of Pennsylvania since 1959. Uh, there's a huge community of sportsmen and hunters in Pennsylvania uh, who pursue white-tailed every year, and you'll see images of white-tailed deer uh, everywhere in Pennsylvania from stickers in the back windows, pickup trucks, uh, to more elegant uh, pieces of artwork on the walls of restaurants, uh, and so forth. Uh, as we'll come back to, as Dr. Hall will no doubt come back to, Pennsylvania uh, is really a combination of uh, Penn, mean from William Penn, the surname of the uh, founder of the English colony in Pennsylvania, and Silvus, meaning wood, uh, in Latin. And so Pennsylvania literally means pens, woods. And Pennsylvania very much is a, a, thinks of itself as a kind of forced uh, culture where hunting is a prominent part of identity. Now, the white-tailed deer are about 150 pounds. Uh, they're about 60 inches high and 40 inches, excuse me, 60 inches long and 40 inches high. Uh, again, you can see in the picture there the relative size of the animal. But the whitetail has a very different uh, ecological trajectory to the elk. It's reckoned that in 1776, this is about the time of the American Revolution, there were more or less uh, 300,000 whitetail in Pennsylvania. But by 1883, uh, due to uh, agriculture and in particular the felling of forests uh, for fuel for uh, industry, uh, by 1883, 80% of Pennsylvania is deforested, and the population of whitetail had fallen to about 50,000. But from the uh, turn of the 20th century, uh, forestation and conservation uh, 
led to the population bouncing back to around about 900,000 by 1980. And now there are an unbelievably, unbelievable 1.5 million uh, white-tailed deer in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Of course, this is about five times the uh, uh, five times the natural population of whitetail in the absence of uh, human beings. Uh, this results in all kinds of problems. Uh, about 275 uh, deer car collisions per day, for example. Uh, the uh, Commonwealth it desperately tries to promote the hunting and eating of these animals because they're they're really something of a, of a plague of Egypt. They, they've adapted to the environment by uh, shifting from eating natural browse or that is to say acorns and and uh, uh, small twigs and things in the forest and grasses. They've they switched from eating those things to eating uh, maize uh, and soya beans grown in farmers' fields. Uh, where they can really just fill their boots any day of the week. Uh, this has led to this uh, tremendous population boom. About 400,000 uh, whitetail are hunted and eaten annually, uh, both privately and uh, on restaurant menus in Pennsylvania. And even removing 400,000 a year from the environment, we still maintain at this point a reasonably steady population of 1.5 million. Again, that's five times as many as would be there in the absence of human agriculture. I mean, there, there are more large mammals in Pennsylvania, of course. Uh, these exist largely in that uh, Allegheny Plateau region in northwest Pennsylvania, uh, which is less densely populated. Uh, black bear, which of course weigh about 20 stone, there are between 1,500 and 2,000 in the state. Uh, again, the population is carefully managed by the uh, Wildlife Conservation Department that uh, issues licenses to hunt and eat three to 500 a year. Bobcat exist uh, in small numbers. No one quite knows how many. They are a protected species. Uh, there are various other names for bobcat, uh, wildcat, uh, or mountain lion, or there's a subspecies slightly smaller called lynx. They're about 36 inches in length and 36 inches in height, weighing a couple of stone. Uh, wolf were extinct in Pennsylvania by 1900. Uh, coyote become rare by about 1900, but with afforestation, they have made a comeback and are now very common existing in the tens of thousands. Uh, red squirrel, gray squirrel, black squirrel, fox squirrel, all kinds of squirrel exist in great abundance. There are also fur bears, and uh, both these edible mammals and fur bears are of uh, great importance both to the indigenous Native Americans uh, that lived in what would become Pennsylvania and the incoming European settlers. Uh, fox, rac fox uh, raccoon, beaver and muskrat, which is a small animal that we do not have in Europe, uh, about the size of a, a rabbit, with, but with uh, uh, a long uh, scaly tail, a bit like a beaver. Uh, these animals are those which are, are, have fur most suitable for uh, clothing and sales uh, on the open market. Uh, fox raccoon and skunk uh, and opossum exist in the millions of Pennsylvania. Uh, Beaver, the uh, largest of the important fur bearers of Pennsylvania, uh, is at a population around 4,500 these days. Uh, it went through the same pattern. Uh, the beaver population went through the same pattern as uh, many other animals, the population declining to about 1,900 uh, when Pennsylvania was at its uh, maximum deforestation, but then recovering with conservation from the turn of the century. Uh, muskrats exist uh, in their millions. Uh, keep in mind, beaver and muskrats are wetland uh, animals, and because of the abundance of wetlands in Pennsylvania, uh, they thrive in large numbers. Uh, fowl in Pennsylvania, we might divide into migratory and non-migratory birds. If we think about those that are eaten, uh, turkeys are indigenous to Pennsylvania. 
Of course, Benjamin Franklin, one of the founding fathers of the United States and uh, a very prominent Pennsylvanian, actually uh, petitioned, I understand, for the turkey to be the national symbol of America rather than the bald eagle. Uh, as you all know from uh, Christmas, of course, turkeys are much better eating than geese. Uh, and they're indigenous to Pennsylvania, along with pheasant, grouse, ducks, and quail, uh, other large uh, uh, fowl, which of course are, are not eaten, include uh, uh, eagles, vultures, heron, hawks, and most bird species that are uh, common in the UK as well, uh, seagulls and so forth, of course. Uh, in terms of migratory birds, the most important of these are geese, particularly what are called Canada geese. Uh, which have a long distance migratory pattern between uh, Ontario and uh, mid to southern Pennsylvania. And as these, this uh, population of large birds moves back and forth south in the autumn and north in the spring, they provide an additional uh, important food source, uh, and these days an additional important part of the uh, sporting and hunting culture of Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, though only having uh, a small amount of its surface area covered with water, about half of 1%, uh, still has a very uh, broad range of species of fish, fish abundant in its waterways. Uh, the Lake Erie fishery, which is Lake Erie being that inland sea off the northwest corner of Pennsylvania, uh, the Lake Erie fishery is commercial in nature and produces uh, perch, lake trout, and walleye. Uh, these are freshwater fish, of course, uh, for consumption. River fisheries include uh, trout, uh, smallmouth, bass, uh, walleye again, uh, and lake and marsh fisheries because, of course, uh, marshlands uh, are also important sources of uh, fish protein. Uh, marshlands contain catfish in particular, also northern pike, largemouth bass, uh, and crappies. So I give you just a, a few images here. You'll notice the theme here where there's some sportsmen's uh, fishing lure in the mouth of the, each kind of fish. There's a crappie in the bottom left here, a largemouth bass uh, in the center, and a walleye at the top, of course, for those of you who uh, are keen fishermen. Uh, there is, a very, again, a very strong culture of uh, sport fishing in Pennsylvania. Again, it's very much part of the identity of the Commonwealth. If we think about a Commonwealth being somewhere where the wealth of the land, the abundance of the land is uh, conceived of as being for the good of everyone living there, why then access to waterways, the fish and uh, forests in which to hunt for uh, fish and red meat uh, are a fundamental part of that identity. So if I move on uh, to the autumn in Pennsylvania, uh, Pennsylvania, because it has uh, Temperatures in the autumn, which typically dip just below freezing at night, but rise above freezing during the day, uh, enjoys these uh, very colorful, beautiful autumn leaves, the colors in the leaves being brought out for that, that brief freeze in the night. Uh, but it means that Pennsylvania is also an important producer of maple syrup. Uh, maple trees, hard maple trees, soft maple trees, both are an important part of the woodland environment of Pennsylvania. And uh, maple syrup comes from uh, the reduced uh, sap from the maple tree and the action of freezing in the, at night and then warming above freezing during the day stimulates the movement of sap within the tree between the leaves and the roots. And so agriculturalists tap into the sides of the trees uh, to siphon off the sap as it moves between a uh, treetop and base between daytime and nighttime in the autumn. Uh, so Pennsylvania is a very important producer of maple syrup. It's rather interesting to me uh, that, the, that Canada has this, this stranglehold monopoly on maple syrup uh, in Britain, uh, when in Pennsylvania, if you purchase maple syrup, it's invariably Pennsylvania maple syrup. Pennsylvania sees snow uh, from November until March. Uh, in November, snow will be intermittent uh, snow will typically cover the ground continuously from mid-December through the end of February, uh, and sometimes uh, as far as, as the first weeks of March. 
average snowfall is about six feet of snow a year in the northwest, about three feet in central uh, Pennsylvania in the mountains. Uh, but in the southeast of Pennsylvania, where Philadelphia is, and I offer you a picture here of Independence Hall in Philadelphia where the Constitution was signed, Constitution of the United States, that is. Uh, in the southeast, uh, annual snowfall can be as little as uh, a foot and a half to two feet. Lakes freeze uh, solid in most of mid and northern Pennsylvania. Uh, for fish, the metabolism slows down. Uh, bears hibernate, of course. Uh, small rodents survive by uh, stockpiling uh, nuts, berries, uh, various uh, forms of browse and burrows under the ground. And deer survive through the winter, in theory, by eating acorns and browse. Uh, browse being those small, tender uh, twiglets, the tips of tree branches. But in reality, these days, uh, deer survive by eating uh, the remnants of maize and beans from fields uh, throughout the winter. Now I'm going to move to the next slide and offer you a short uh, video of uh, Connick Lake, Pennsylvania in the winter, just to give you an idea of how extreme uh, the shift to a cold winter climate is. Okay, now this uh, video should play on its own in your browser. Uh, if it doesn't, uh, stop the playback, come back to the slide, uh, and hit play on the button in the center of the screen. Uh, this is a YouTube video, of course. Now, uh, this map just shows you uh, annual snowfall in Pennsylvania between 1981 and 2010. And I, I just really want to impress upon you how extreme uh, the winters are in Pennsylvania by comparison to uh, what you'll be familiar with from Britain. If you no look in the northwest of Pennsylvania in particular, uh, up here on the shores of Lake Erie, you'll see that the annual snowfall up there is uh, somewhere around 120, uh, 120 inches. Uh, which if there's 12 inches in a foot, that's about 10 feet of snow uh, a year, which is quite remarkable. But I, I also want you to see the way in which the difference in snowfall between the north and south, south of the Commonwealth uh, lines up with that, a very distinct environmental, <coughs> excuse me, very distinct environmental difference between the northern half and the southern half of the Commonwealth, the dividing line being just here about the middle of Pennsylvania. Uh, green down here has the lowest snowfall, uh, perhaps uh, as little as a foot or two in the Philadelphia catchment area and again here in the southwest in the Pittsburgh catchment area, these being the two major cities of Pennsylvania. I want to wrap up this uh, short lecture by saying a little bit about human responses uh, to the winter. Uh, it's important to understand that uh, this has a, a very direct and immediate impact on issues like homelessness. Uh, really, homelessness can be a, a death sentence in Pennsylvania. It, it's very easy to freeze to death at night, and homeless people do uh, very uh, sadly and unfortunately occasionally freeze to death at night in Pennsylvania. The finding shelter is uh, of fundamental importance. Uh, obviously, wood cutting. Uh, and wood storage is a, a major historic uh, and current uh, industry in Pennsylvania, uh, particularly with the uh, dramatic uh, afforestation of Pennsylvania in the latter half of the 20th century, uh, in which much of the farmland cleared in the 19th century has now been returned to forestland. Uh, a great many people in Pennsylvania heat their homes uh, with wood. Uh, it's accessible and it's relatively uh, abundant and cheap. Uh, food storage, uh, both for uh, Native Americans and for uh, European settlers, uh, right up until modern Pennsylvania, uh, is very much an important part of Pennsylvania culture and life. If you think about, uh, uh, say, for example, meat from game for three to four months of a year, uh, that can be stored in, in snow or ice. And there used to be an important industry in Pennsylvania of cutting blocks of ice from lakes and waterways 
uh, for use throughout the summer months for the storage of uh, foodstuffs as well. Uh, ice fishing is very common as well, for example. Uh, this is people adapting their uh, food uh, storage and acquisition to the winter months. Uh, canning of food, the, this is the kind of uh, uh, preparing of food for storage in jars in one's home uh, has been of historic importance and continues to be very common in rural communities in Pennsylvania today. Uh, quilting, which today is sometimes uh, most associated with the Pennsylvania Amish or Pennsylvania Dutch, as they're sometimes called, uh, is an important uh, occupation throughout the winter months. You have to think a little bit about the, the kind of psychological importance of being in a place where for two or three months a year, being outside for more than a, a short period of time can potentially uh, be deadly. Uh, and so this really shapes how you interact with the environment. Uh, snow plowing is a major necessity and a major expense uh, in the modern Commonwealth state, Pennsylvania. Uh, frost heave, for example, the process of the uh, top two feet or so of soil freezing and expanding in the winter uh, and then thawing and contracting in the spring is a very important consideration uh, for even the most basic uh, of, of uh, structural architecture and building. This, for example, in this picture in the bottom right, is a picture of some foundations, probably from under a our garden shed say you can see they're all higgledy piggledy because they haven't dug deeply enough uh, when they put in the foundations to get below that layer of soil which freezes and thaws uh, leading to the the kind of disruption of foundations and the, the topsy-turvy uh, no doubt topsy-turvy state of the building above this is all just to say that that serious consideration advanced consideration has to be given to the environment, particularly uh, cold and freezing conditions, which can destroy not only foundations, but pipes and other uh, infrastructure. Uh, serious consideration has to be given to that in advance. And it means that when things are built, they tend to be built uh, much less superficially than they're built, say, for example, in southern parts of the United States, because there's really very little choice. Uh, to have a basement under, under your home is really uh, absolutely bog standard in Pennsylvania. Uh, this gives you somewhere a subterranean space basically below that frost line which you can store goods. Uh, and you'll see a very common type of house, particularly in northwest Pennsylvania, uh, is a home in which the you enter at a kind of mid-level and go up a few stairs to an, a, a totally above ground living level or you go down a half flight of stairs to a partially underground living level. This allows the insulating properties of the soil to make the house uh, cheaper and easier to insulate. Uh, compared to Britain in summer there is greater biodiversity and a remarkable abundance of uh, both food and agricultural goods but in the winter uh, there is a, a very much a marked scarcity of these things. <laughs>